This morning I want to start a new series. Well, next week you're going to be uh, privileged to hear a really good preacher, uh, my wife. And uh, so I, I'm pretty excited to watch it next week from California. Um, Whoever is going to do that for me. Uh, I, God has just really spoken to my heart um, at the beginning of the summer. I, I love reading. You guys know I love reading. And and I picked up two books. The one, first book that I preached through, and I always preach the Bible because that is the main book. Amen. Um, so, but you get inspiration. You get you just get inspiration from a lot of reading. And I've been reading several books, and I'm I'm actually getting ready. If you, any of you like leading leader books and stuff, uh, on Friday mornings in a couple weeks, we're getting ready to read. Uh, a book called Killing Lincoln, and uh, if you want to join that, it's Friday mornings on se- at 7.30 at the library. So um, so if you want to join us, we would love to have you. Sometimes we have donuts if that's any impression upon you. But uh, I want to talk about, this week we're going to talk about grace, then we have a break with my wife, and then we're going to finish. Grace is just very important. Yes, that's right. and, and something that we kind of take lightly sometimes. Mm-hmm. So I, I talked about understanding and hearing God's will, but I want to talk about grace. I read a book uh, called Grace is Greater, and it's subtitled Grace, God's Plan to Overcome Your Past, Redeem Your Pain, and Rewrite Your Story. Amen. And, and I picked it up just because I love the cover. Have you ever picked up a book just because you love the color cover? Yeah. And, and I thought, oh, how simple can it be? There's the cover. I mean, you can't get any simpler than that. It probably took about five minutes and a coloring crayon to make the cover. <laughs> I mean, just simple. And I thought, okay, if it's that simple, and I've read several books uh, that Kyle has written, and I'm like, how simple is that? So I was wondering, okay, grace. Grace is something we hear about a lot, but we don't put it into practice, do we? We don't give grace to people when they, they deserve it, when they ask for it. When they ask for forgiveness, we don't usually give it to them. So grace is something we need to understand. We don't give ourselves grace. So um, this morning I want to preach to you on this topic. Grace is greater than your mistakes. Does anybody in this place ever make mistakes? Everyone's like, oh, oh, I ain't raising my hand. I'm not saying yes. I'm not going to even say amen because I am perfect. Okay, service is over with. Because I think we all are imperfect. God even plays it, puts it simply in the Bible that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is simple that, that we are imperfect beings. We are imperfect. We are sinners. We are imperfect. There is not a perfect bone in our body. I love it when and Keith Thompson in junior high, Keith Thompson was this smart guy in, in junior high who came to ch- school crying because he got a B in, in school. And I says, Keith, what's wrong with you? He said, I got a B on my test. I says, what? I says, I was lucky to get a D in, in junior high. I says, give me a stinking break. You got a B, you passed. And he just goes, my parents are going to give me a hard time. I'm like, what? I'm lucky I got a D. My dad was happy if I got a C, you know. He just didn't care if I was average. Sometimes we got to understand that we are, we do make mistakes. We are imperfect, and God's okay with that. But here's, a, a, here's what we need to understand. Our sin is ugly, but God's grace is greater than any past mistakes or regrets that we have. In the book, uh, I love it when, when authors define, because I don't like picking up dictionaries at all. That's one book I hate, or encyclopedias. Okay, you can Google in Wikipedia because you can change the definition in Wikipedia. We, we've decided that we can do that. Um, that's what I like to do. If I can make up a word, I can add it to it. So, um, a dictionary, uh, let's get to it. Eidelman shares a few interesting words that have been recently added to the dictionary. Phoenicia, disconfect, and blame storming. Uh, yeah, those are new words for you. Put that in your dictionary and, and enjoy it. Unlike the words, grace is a term we've heard countless times. This brings with it danger. 
The word grace is so common it doesn't feel very amazing. So God's grace is more beautiful, freeing, and although greater than we could ever imagine. So here we go. Let's jump into this. The more we recognize that the ugliness of our sin, the more we can appreciate the beauty of God's grace. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? We know that. We've seen that. We have all sinned. Everyone in this room has sinned. Right? We've all sinned. We see that also in, in Romans that it is by grace that we have been saved. How awesome is that? So if we can admit that we're all sin, we can say we also are saved by grace. It's God's grace that we have been saved. Our ability is to appreciate grace in the direction of correlation to the degree to which we can acknowledge that we need God's grace. God's grace is what we need. In the, in the book, I'm going to re- reference it a lot, so I'm quoting, because I have little tabs. So if you want to see where I'm quoting from, there you go. Got it? Page 26, by the way. Mayor Bloomberg from New York City says this. Everyone know who he is? He says this. But if senses that he may not have much time left as he would like, he has little doubt about what would await him at Judgment Day. Pointing to his work on gun safety, obesity, smoke cessation, he said with a grin, I'm telling you if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I'm heading straight in and I have earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. Basically what he's saying, hey, I made it. I've done all that I can do. I've worked my way into it. Bloomberg said that. So guess what? He says, hey, I've done it. I've worked by, we know what the Bible says. We can't work our way into something. Salvation is not a works base. It is a grace base. So when we understand that, Bloomberg got it wrong. So he's not going to make it through the pearly gates. He, unless he says, Jesus, I need you. I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. My sin is ugly, but your grace is beautiful. And when we understand that, the grace of God is greater. Hallelujah. Grace is greater. God's grace is more beautiful than that, your brokenness. John 4, 1 through 30. Here, Jesus is literally talking about the Samaritan woman. Listen to this. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judah, Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go to, through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the p- plot of, of of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from a, the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. I love that. Don't ask me why I love that so much. It just... I wrote a paper in school about the essence of time. Okay. We won't get in that paper. All right. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God, who who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with with, and the well is deep. Where, where Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us 
the well and drank from it, it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me that, this water so I won't be thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she said. Jesus said to her, you are right when you said, say you have no husband. The fact is, you ha say you have no husband. The fact is, you have five husbands, and the man you now have in your is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestor worshiped one on this mountain, but you Jews claim that this place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans will worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seek. God is spirit and the worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Boop. Yeah. Okay. Jesus then, his disciples returned and was surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want? Why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Come, th come this, could this be the Messiah? They came out to, of the town and made their way toward him. Wow. Think about it. Like we see in the story of the woman at the well, when God's grace and mercy collided with our shame and guilt, it's messy. But it's beautiful. Jesus knows everything you ever did. But he wants to make sure you know that his grace is greater. He can call you on your stuff. But he can make you better. Don't think you can get away with all the stuff that you think you're getting away with. Because he knows you right where you sit. You think you can get away with it, but he knows your very heart. He knows the very heart that's beating inside your chest. He knows when you think you're getting away with it, he knows you. Are you like the woman at the well going, oh, I'm just, I'm just scooping up water. But he knows you. He's going to call you out. He knows you. <clears throat> I love it. Sometimes we think we're getting away with something, but God knows you. Amen. Do you know that Jesus is omnipresent? Yes. Yes. You know that means he's everywhere? Yep. Yep. When you go to this place or this place and you think you're getting away from it, but he's right there with you. When you say that bad word, he's right there with you going, oh. <laughs> Do you know he's right there with you when you're speeding? Do you know he's right there when you're watching that bad movie? Do you know he's right there when you yell at your spouse? What? Do you know he's right there when you cry? Do you know he's right there when you're at the altar? He's everywhere. He knows you right where you're at. He was with the young man as he's with his father yesterday. And as, he, and as the father passed away, he was there. Yes. 
The very fact is, when will we as a people understand that God is omnipresent and he's in the midst of our brokenness and he understands our brokenness, but we're not willing to give him the broken pot, which is us. The Bible says that he is the potter and we are the clay, but we're willing to keep on holding the pieces, but we're not willing to give him the pieces. God's grace is greater. He loves our brokenness because he loves to fix us. I think sometimes the church today, we look at the brokenness and say, oh, keep living the way you want to live. We're not going to preach about brokenness. Keep living the way you want to live because that's okay. I'm not okay with brokenness because I know the potter. He, even if we're the clay, God's going to fix the brokenness and make you the vessel that he wants you to be because the Bible calls if we're a vessel of honor, not a vessel of acceptance. There's a big difference. There's a vessel of honor or a vessel of self-seeking. I'd rather be a vessel of honor. There's churches out there that are vessels of self-seeking. Come and come to our church and do whatever you want and we'll still worship, but we're not going to worship with spirit and in truth. Church, I'm telling you that this church is always going to work towards being vessels of honor. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What are you going to do with your brokenness? Are you going to keep on carrying the brokenness in your hands or are you going to finally give it to the potter and let him remold it and let you be the vessel of honor that you're called to be? God's grace redeems all our past regrets. John 21, 15 through 19 says this. This is where Jesus reinstates Peter. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Jesus said, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Jesus, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? At this point, Peter was hurt because Jesus answered him the third time. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. I love this. I think he's trying to get a point across. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you stretched, were stretched out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said, this is to indicate that the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This passage illustrates Jesus is telling Peter that he doesn't have to be imprisoned by his regrets. That's right. That's right. Jesus still has a great plan for Peter. Amen. See, God has the power to redeem our regrets. Amen. We don't have to keep on living with our past stuff. See, we think we have to be clothed with our past stuff. Many times in life, I keep reliving moments and it continues to redefine me. But we don't have to have that define who we are. Stuff that we've done in the past doesn't have to redefine it, doesn't have to redefine you, doesn't have to redefine me. Doesn't have to define me. We don't have to be defined by our past, but we do have to be defined by our future. Are we going to let the
the things of our past, the things that we have done wrong, the mistakes that we have made in our past. Define us. Are we going to finally take the brokenness, like a number two, and give it to God and say, God, I give you what's going on in my life. Redefine me, remold me, recreate me into what you want me to be, the vessel of honor to recreate me so I can be what you want me to be. Yeah. Because God's grace is greater. Sometimes we think our stuff, our baggage, our garbage is unforgivable. I'm going to give you a, a, a kind of a straightforward answer. Sometimes we are the ones that are unforgivable. We aren't real willing to forgive ourselves. We hold a mirror in front of ourselves and we say, man, am I such a loser. If I didn't do that in the past... If I didn't allow that to take place. We hold that baggage as, as though much of the same. How many of you guys have a closet full of just stuff? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I have suits in my closet. When was the last time you seen me wear a suit? And was like, God, oh, I don't really care. <laughs> The very fact is I have not worn a suit for many years, but I have 14 suits sitting my, up in my closet. My wife just came to me, baby, you're taking up the closet. Will you clean out the closet? 14 suits. When I lost all my weight, I can't fit in my suits anymore, but I still hold on to them because I think someday I'll wear them again. The only way that I'll ever wear them again is if I put all that weight back on. You know what? I don't want to do that. Because some of that weight was all my depression from my past. Because, see, your past begins to define you in different ways in your body. Not all weight defines you. But I'm telling you, sometimes we get defined by different. Maybe your attitude defines your past. This is just the way I am. If you don't like me, you know, get away from me. I'm just cranky all the time. Sometimes that begins to define what your past was. I had an uncle, Uncle Paul. I would never let my kids, my Paul, Uncle Paul, pass away. But my wife never met Uncle Paul. Uncle Paul was a W-2 POW. Uncle Paul, when I met him when I was really little, was kind. But then he began to get really cranky. I love my Uncle Paul. But no one would ever bring our spouses to meet Uncle Paul. None of us. Because Uncle Paul was just kind of mean sometimes. So we would go see Uncle Paul. My dad and my brother would go see Uncle Paul. Well... Love Uncle Paul. But he wore the things from the war on him. PTSD, before we knew what to call it. But that was him. Things begin to define us. But you know, God's grace is greater. Don't let your past define what you can be in the future. Let, let God make you the vessel of honor. How do you do that? Give that stuff. Get to the altar. Allow God to begin to work on your life. Sometimes we begin to uh, make our regrets lead us into remorse. The right response is when we confront our sin, God's grace won't leave us there, but there will be God's grace will be found most often found right there God's grace when we start seeking God God's grace will meet us there and God's grace will heal us because God's grace is willing to meet us there God's grace is greater let me conclude with this with these questions will you let your past mistakes destroy your life Or will you let them become a trophy of God's grace? 
See, if you realize our need for God's grace and submit yourself to him, his grace will transform your lives. Because God's grace is greater than anything in your past. See, the very fact is, I don't know if I'm preaching this to you or I'm preaching this to me. See, when I picked up this book, I was like, oh, God's plan to overcoming your past, redeeming your pain, and rewrite your story. I was like, oh, that could be for me. But then I started praying, maybe it's for you. Or maybe it's for all of us. I don't know. But, but if it's for just for me, you get to come for the ride with me. And I just get to preach a whole series. And you just get to sit there and go, oh, that must be for him. But it's really all about God's grace. Remember the very first passage of scripture I said to you. Put it up, Romans 3.23. It says God's grace for all have sinned and fallen short of the God, glory of God. That's us. But then in Romans it says we are all saved by God's grace. We fall into those two verses simultaneously. It is grace that we've been saved, my friends. And if we cannot recognize how awesome that is, that we have all sinned and that we need God's grace. And when those two verses collide in our system, God's grace is greater. Because what we really do deserve, we deserve hell. I've preached... And I've talked to too many people who don't know God. And they say, well, I'm a good person. Maybe Bloomberg, hey, says, hey, I'm a good person. I'm just going to walk through the pearly great gates and because I've done all these good things. And look, I, I've done gun control. I've fought obesity. I've done cigarette control or whatever you want to call it. But hey, I've done all these things. I'm just going to walk through the pearly gates. The Bible is very specific about works. They don't work. Because the very fact is Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen for short of the glory of God. And it's only by grace that we are saved. And that was Jesus who went to the cross for us. It is by that simple grace. Simple grace. Man, we need that grace. We all need that grace this morning. If you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. You heard this. It, it, it really pierced and spoke into your heart. Maybe you're in your brokenness right now. Maybe you just, I don't know, you, when, I, when I talked about the broken vessel, and you felt like that, and you say, God, I just need you to put me back together. Because it just feels like you're, you're just falling apart. And I'm just going to pray for you at the, the service, at the end of the service. If that is you right now, you say, God, I just need you right now. I want you to just raise your hand and say, that's, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Lord, I pray for those people that raise their hands that just seems like they're throwing vessels and they're shattered. Lord, the Bible says that you are the potter and we are the clay. And I pray right now in the midst of their brokenness that, Lord God, that you just put them back together. You put them back together, you begin to remold them, Lord God, in our brokenness. It says that we can come to you and, Lord, and you will put us back together. That is, that right there in the midst, that you'll meet us there. I pray that, Lord God, that you do that. Lord, I thank you that, Lord God, that you are such a big God. That, Lord God, in the midst of the brokenness, that, Lord God, that you can wrap your loving arms around us. That, Lord God, that you can heal our brokenness. That, Lord, that you can love us so much. That, Lord God, that, that day that you hung on the cross, you stretched out your arms and you said, I love you this much. Love us 
us this much. And I pray that, Lord God, in the midst of our brokenness, that you give us back to you. And Lord, I thank you for speaking to us. That, Lord, that you challenged us, that you spoke directly to us. That, Lord God, even in the midst of our brokenness, Lord, Lord that your grace is greater. Thank you. Join us for a little bit more worship.